Hello everyone, my name is Tim Sheehan, editor of the Brewers Journal. We're here today at Beaver Towns Brewery in Lockwood in Tottenham Hale and it's a pleasure to be joined and welcomed by Nikola Marianovic, the Operations Director at Beaver Town. How are you? Yeah, hey, hello, I'm great. How are you Tim? I'm alright, thank you. I'm alright. It's um, Beaver Towns Brewery that means a lot to me. Um, like a lot of uh, beer fans, you know, over the years, um, seeing the brewery grow and evolve and, and, and change in that time and, uh, you know, obviously beers needless to say, Neckel, Gamma Ray, Lupuloid, Bloody L, you know, to name but a few, um, pretty much made an indelible mark on the modern craft beer landscape. And um, I've been really keen to catch up for, for quite some time, actually, Nicola, because your work previously before Beavertown at Brewdog in Ellen and um, here at Beavertown, you know, I can only start to guess how many beers people enjoy on a weekly basis on tap, in can, bottle shops, supermarkets, have come from kit that you've specified, commissioned and built. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for reminding me for a, for a chat, Tim. And uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of our Brewer's Journal and everything, uh, all the stuff, all good stuff that you guys are doing. Uh, keen to support every event and uh, have a chat at any time. I appreciate that, I appreciate that. And it's, um, you know, as I said, it's, it's, you know, we started in 2015 on the first week of, of really going out after a lot of planning. Got to see John Keeling at Fuller's, but a few days before, just over there, um, just out of shot, was with Logan doing these initial uh, conversations. And you know, it was, a, it was a crazy time for Beaver Town, you know, as it yeah. always is. You know, it was um, a couple of years obviously after they started, this Lockwood was still very fresh, very new, um, million miles an hour, really. Yeah, but I think that 2015 was the year when uh, Beavertown made its mark and became probably one of the most trendiest uh, small breweries in the country. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, the, there was time where I was living in Kent and there was Odd Bins or Threshers, one of these wine shops, uh, off license things. And you had to put your name on a waiting list. And that waiting list was we get Gamma Ray, we get two cases, you yeah. can have six cans max yeah and i was on the waiting list with four five other people you get the email scurry down and do yeah. it and then you know i remember the same year bloody hell as well or maybe the year after and again it was it was a big deal and yeah. it's really interesting because the landscape's changed a lot yeah and um, it's matured a lot craft beer is no longer new to a lot of people yeah it's a norm it's a norm and and beers like Neck Oil are now synonymous, you know, with beer taps across London, the UK. You know, yeah. it's, um, and I think there's a lot of hard work, obviously a lot of hard work, you know, going on behind the scenes yeah. to, to make that happen. Yeah, I think if you look at it historically, there's, uh, you always need to have a bit of luck. Um, but then, uh, supported by the hard work, usually uh, kind of turns out well. Um, yeah. And luck, when I say that, that is an opportunity that uh, arises. And then if you catch it and you work smart around it, um, you know, it, it brings your odds to a success to a quite a high level. And yeah. I think if you start with 2015, that was probably a pinnacle when uh, almost anything was possible in yeah. this uh, 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 environment of uh, new breweries, people trying to make their mark and uh, approaching beer as an art uh, in many different ways, you know, from a design, which we s can see what Nick done uh, yeah. in Beavertown and many other breweries. Uh, I'm not that familiar with all the, <laughs> the great people that are behind uh, these amazing brands and, uh, and designs, but that is one aspect. And then the artists within the art of making a great beer and, 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 and making it, you know, approachable to people well that's it you know london there's many great breweries um there still are countless fantastic breweries just before here today was with ben and the team at yeah. pressure drop you know one of london's finest i yeah. think very underrated uh, great people great beers great and neighbors great neighbors <laughs> yeah indeed they say the same about you and it's um but you know 2015 around that time it really felt like it was lockwood you know uh, here was the epicenter it was, you know, when there was a beer festival, a birthday, you know, the, the all in, you know, yeah. you pay your money, you come, you get your glass. It was the place to be. Yeah. You know. 
And we, I mean, we'll talk about that probably later, but you know, I, I think everything for me and uh, for Logan in particular, everything starts and uh, ends with people and yep. these good vibes. And I think uh, if you go across the road in unit 17 and 18, there's this tiny kitchen and we call it like uh, a cultural hub of Beaver Town because everybody will come and have their breakfast or make their coffee or a tea or even lunch. And uh, this is where, when the team was smaller, up to 40 people at the beginnings when I joined, everybody will have a chance to talk to Logan. It was like a one big yeah. family. Uh, obviously, we grew up now, but I believe that every brewery has that kind of place where you can kind of interact. And, and that's where the magic happens in the culture. And also, Logan, as he is, uh, he created that kind of culture where you know he's approachable. Anything as you talk about the life, he was interested in every individual in this company. So it was just uh, lovely, and it's it's it it is the is the base from everything. You know, the excellence thrive from that. Yeah, and I think obviously, you know, your role operations director at Beaver Town is an incredible position. Um, you know, you 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 had to do a lot <laughs> in that time with this company but I think let's you know uh, for people that don't know if we can just take it back a little bit to the beginning of your career I mean you yeah. studied at the University of Novi Sad Novi Sad yes in, in Serbia but upon graduating there it wasn't long before you ended up in a in a brewing role in yeah. Serbia yeah yes so I was heavily yeah I went through a grammar school and then you know it was always a question what to study but my mom was um uh, food engineer as well, but she ended up in a career as a as a teacher. But you know, always that kind of drift towards the science, science natural sciences, uh, and particularly through her experience and and, and, and affiliation, kind of drew me that I, I shouldn't do economics, I shouldn't do sports because I was heavily invested in sports, um, and then ended up doing that. And then the second question was which course to take because you know it could be chemical engineering it could be petrol engineering it could be pharma and i was like well i i kind of see myself closer to food so let's do food uh, technology and then it was like what's the major and then it ended up being a microbiological processes so it's a bit different school different 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 schooling system than in uk but more like what it is in european countries so you would do an engineering course for three and a half years and then almost kind of you go it now into what is a master with your kind of graduate subjects and in my case that was microbiological processes so anything from wastewater yeah. yeast management spirits wine and beer wow. so it, it came in handy because now we have a wastewater treatment plant so so I'm doing two technologies at the moment that I studied in the uni so that was Novisad um, and um, it took me quite a while to finish my degree, I have to say, because I had many other interests. Um, That's helpful. And I, yeah, and, uh, and I, I think I was the last generation that had to do an obliga obligation in military service. So <laughs> just wow. a waste of time. Um, so it took me a bit longer to finish all that uh, until I start properly working. Then got a job in a lab, in an oil refinery, and then after that, lucky enough to get a job in the biggest Ser Serbian um, brewery and generally it's a bit different here you kind of need to make your mark through our junior levels as a brewer and then try to come in um, in a standard system I came there is as a supervisor in a production a four million hectoliter brewery. Wow. <laughs> so it's just like somebody throws you and it's just like this you, you have three weeks to prepare you're going into a shift and you are taking care of 30 operators that have been here for 20 years so so it was a tremendous challenge but I, th I think that was something always that that I enjoyed in life being thrown in a kind of challenging situations and trying to learn how to swim while while you're doing it yeah. and did you take that position back in Serbia with a view to working and living abroad or, or, no. or did that happen organically no it was um to be honest, it's, a, it's like in anyone's life. It's a chain of events determine your destiny. So for me, what happened is um, I was doing really well in the first two years. Uh, and I was learning a lot. I, I, I have to say, at that time, that was part of AB InBev, or InBev, and then became AB InBev while I was there. Uh, it's definitely be the best uh, educational three years I had in my life. And also, I didn't have... Uh, 
um, uh, kids at that time, and I just immersed myself. I was doing like, I don't know, 60, 70 hours a week, like full on. But it, it was not because somebody was forcing me, it's because I was so interesting and intrigued in what was happening there, because they had the best kit, they had the best knowledge, there was great people around. It was just the right, right yeah. atmosphere and timing at that particular pace, and I was lucky to be part of it. So I propelled quite quickly, and then in two years, I got an opportunity to get a more senior position within the, but I kind of decided to stay another year and learn my ropes a bit better around cellaring and filtration, because I was focusing quite a lot on a brew house and uh, yeast management to begin with. Um, and then I actually got a job to be a zone specialist in InBev, but then InBev sold the Central European operation. So my kind of career progress was stopped there. Um, and I, I actually, because of that kind of huge change, I couldn't see where my career was progressing. And at that time, funny enough, to kind of connect the story with how I moved abroad, uh, one of my colleagues, she was a process engineer in brewing department, Anna, she went to a Brau Beviala, and she, I think she met James and Martin there. Okay. And then she came back and she told me, oh, I met these guys and I checked them out. They do these crazy beers and blah, blah, blah. And we always know how at the beginnings, the, the marketing and everything they were doing, it was, <laughs> it was quite, quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so just going through my head, what's the next step? I actually just wanted to see what that new kind of... And the intention was actually to go and see, get connected with somebody, go and see. And I always had this um, entrepreneurial mind. I think my ultimate goal was to open or go learn something new. And with the knowledge I had from the big brewery, kind of started a small brewery of my own in my hometown. And that was like 2010. Uh, so what I did, I sent an email to Martin and James or Martin, I, I can't even remember. And I got a reply. And the question was like, listen, I do this and this. I'm super keen to see what you guys are doing, but I'm Serbian. I need a visa for UK. And I don't have much money. So if you could help me with accommodation, that would be great. So I need a, I need a way to get a visa. I would pay my own plans to come. I just want to come and see what you guys are doing. And they were like super cool. And... Uh, helped me with that. So in, in, in May 2010, I went to Fraser Butter. <laughs> and I... Uh, I uh, Bit of a change from Yeah, I spent a week there with them and it was just like, oh my God. So from 4 million, the modernist brewery you can find in Europe to our Fraser Butter. And I don't know that many people that have seen that place and how it operated, but it was just with very little making fantastic beer. So you go in and it's like, wow, are they allowed to make a beer in a shed like this? <laughs> but then the second thing what happens is the smell. I mean, it was, it was the best thing. And then I, even to this day, I remember trying 5M Saint in 2010 for the first time. Yeah. I have to remind everybody, Punk IPA at that time wasn't dry hop. So, wow. so there was a clear kind of punch. If you wanted a hoppy punch, you were actually getting that from 5M Saint. Really? We, we changed it later on when I started. Um, but 5M Saint, even, you know, I get goosebumps when I remember that feeling. And then I was like, this is something different. I like two of them and what they were doing. And, you know, it was on so far north from, if you put the, if you put a, a, a point in my hometown and you draw a circle around it, you catch a bit of Portugal, Aberdeen, and then you go almost to Kavkaz behind Moscow. So just to <laughs> represent to everybody how Aberdeen is away from my hometown. Wow. And I never wow. lived abroad. So through chain of the events, we, we, we kind of agreed that I will move to uh, Scotland. And naively, I agreed with my wife. I was married at the time. Should we do it? Should we try it? And always the intention was to go to a short period of time. So maybe two years. And then one thing over there led to another. And, uh, you know, the whole story and what we've done at that time was so good and... They took good care of me at the beginning yeah. and, and, you know, helped me, gave me, you know, I thrive when somebody gives me a, a yeah. space to do my own thing. And, and I think I complemented their skill sets and Martin and I did yeah. worked really well to be, uh, at the beginning and throughout the years. Um, and, you know, he was extremely creative. I was extremely the doer and, you know, taking care of the team and the yeah. people and building that. So... I think we did well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, 
what was the uh, the scale of the projects that you were involved in there? Because, I mean, it was no, well, mean, no mean feat, the, the, yeah. the way that Brewdog grew in that uh, six yeah. and a bit years. I, I think my first project was in my big brewery. Um, and, you know, it's 900 hectoliter brew houses, two running in parallel. Uh, and the, the older brew house, which had a GEA Hoopman kit, um, the steam jackets were damaged and a lot of condensate was leaking. So my first project was changing steam jackets on a GEA kit, on a 900 cat, uh, hectoliter mesh ton um, with a Crohn's <laughs> All right. stuff. Uh, and so it was, it was, it was kind of an interesting project. So that was the first time that I've seen what a big project is actually. Um, and then at BrewDog, when I came, it was Fraser Butter. It was like the, the big steel vats. They were designed to be a brew house. Uh, it's, it, was, it's, it was below average. It was, it was making a wart on something that is not designed to do that. <laughs> um, so a lot of difficulties, but I think I have to mention Stuart Bowman, who was definitely the, 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 the strongest. I think culturally, uh, and, and uh, you know, technically at that time when I came, I learned so much from him. Uh, so yeah, I don't know if he's now in distilling and, and, and far away from brewing, but that's probably one of the most influential people that I worked with in my life. Um, incredible human. Um, so we were doing crazy stuff and then I was trying to improve the planning, the way how we do things, how we move the stuff around. And you know, to say that, I was pretty weak in packaging uh, when I joined, I was quite strong in brewing, but quite weak in packaging. Um, so I had to learn as well, you know, how, how do you do that on a small scale? How the small kegerator work? How does the packaging line work with, you know, with the team? Because I was not part of the commissioning. But because the momentum was there, and, you know, James knows how to push business forward, we, um, we quite quickly, I think in a year, started negotiating around... Uh, stuff where and how to build the new brewery. I think the first design that they had in their head and presented to me even before I came was one thing and then it ended up to be uh, a brewery in Allen. And I always thought when we were doing that, we we're gonna create something that will be up to 100, 200, maybe 300,000 hectoliters. And you know, you guys know the story, you know, what they've done over there. Um, and, and it's it's crazy now. It's 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 probably at the level of uh, just shoulder to shoulder with the uh, tenants. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So it's Indeed. probably second biggest brewery in wow. Scotland at the moment, wow. and one of the biggest in this country. We have bars and restaurants and pubs all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what um, what led you to to London? Because you did six or so years. Of, yeah, with, with Bo Brewdog. Bo yeah, both of my kids were born. They're little Aberdonians. <laughs> <laughs> so, a Serbian kids born in Scotland, living in London now. Yeah. Did they have a sports Last team? So, uh, yeah, I mean, we've done like both of them are huge supporters of Tottenham because we built a little brewery over okay, there, and yeah. I got fond with I'll the club. It. And I was never a big football fan, but I started supporting Spurs. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope they will do better this year. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> they, they, they started well. You know, it's a long old season. Yeah, but, um, yeah, it's a lot to do. But, you know, coming from working for a big business back home in Serbia yeah. to then that, that growth trajectory yeah. at, at BrewDog, um, it must have been a, an enticing project, but also one that really needed to appeal yeah, to you. So, to, so, to, yeah, so the, the thing at BrewDog to mention maybe is that we did some contract brewing along the way, so I learned a bit how that's done. We built a new brewery, and then because we didn't have a huge budget like we did when we were building Anfield here, um, B World, um, where I could kind of put everything in place from A to Z. Um, over there, we invested heavily in a brew house, and then we used the equipment that we had. We naively bought a centrifuge that was not 100% designed. We promised they will be designed for. Um, and then we implemented the filter. I mean, we all now know and seeing what we do, do at Beavertown that you can produce a pretty bright, not completely bright, but you know, consistently bright beers without the filter. Uh, but filtration was kind of, if you look at the West Coast momentum in US and what BrewDog started with, it was always part of the process. 
uh, and I was quite happy that we kind of stayed away after, after, afterwards, so drifting away from original question, but seller was being built as we were generating revenue and cash and had um, an ability to invest in it. So seller I was building kind of with the team, little by little, always trying to improve, then, you know, it, 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 was, it, it was like that, just uh, I have a proposal, marketing assess it, and then we move forward. Um, so, and, and that was nice. So it was a, a good bottling packaging line and a good brew house, and then, you know, find a way how you do the middle, which was the cellar. Yeah. Where now the cellar over there, same as the beer world, is quite modern and, and fully automatic. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's how I learned. Uh, you wow. know, one step at a time, yeah. you know, you get yeah. a few hundreds of thousands of pounds to spend on a kit. And you try to find a way what's the best way to uh, spend that money. And then, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, months, years maybe, um, you joined Beaver Town. And yeah. then shortly after that, you know, the, one of the biggest sort of seismic shifts, I suppose, in, in the world of, of craft beer was, you know, growing out of Tottenham Hale, which was already a, a big space in, in the world of craft beer but also to, to build this fantastic new um, Enfield facility. And then obviously with that came the announcement um, about the minority state that Heineken took. So yeah. it must have been a really interesting, exciting time to be in your position, being asked yeah. to play a role in specifying, commissioning and building this huge new site. Yeah, I, I, I knew Logan and Jen from before. Um, I had a good relationship with uh, them. <laughs> we didn't kind of see each other often, but I remember they were at, at the brewery once in Scotland, and they wanted to see the kit and how we do stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I inherited what was here. First project was Lockwood, how we optimized that mm -hmm. and how we set up the contract brewing because there was only so much we could do here. So our first contract brewer was Red Church. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that was kind of a joint venture where we kind of invested a bit in their kit for, in order for them to have a space to brew for us. But they had a quite a similar brew houses here. So we could kind of replicate what we do quite easily. And, you know, I have to say, you know, it was challenging. And, you know, it's always tough when somebody else needs to make your beer. But I think throughout the years, we've, we've done a lot of that. And, um, again, it comes to people. Yeah. You know, you come into somebody else's almost house, that's the brewery, you know, I have this saying, you know, there's 200 brewers, 300 opinions. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to get away with yourself sometimes in a brewery, you know, if somebody else steps in and tells you how to do course, stuff. So you kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a collaboration. You need to let the brewmaster at that brewery do their thing, but then again, you need to protect how you value it, what is the yeah. success of your own beer. And, and it's, it's not easy, but it's possible. And, and, and I think that the other thing is, that I don't know what it is with Nequil, but it's, it's, it, it's not as difficult, for example, as Gamma Ray to replicate uh, in a different, in, on a different kit. Gamma Ray is quite, quite tough, I have to say. So we, we, we needed some time to adjust the Gamma Ray from uh, Lockwood with the Gamma Ray at, yeah. at, at, at an Anfield. Um, so, so yeah, that, 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 was the, that, that was the first thing. But um, yeah, how I, I joined, uh, I, was, I started talking to Logan. I think he was out for a head brewer. And I gave him a call at one point. And I said, like, do you know what? I'm, I'm not a head brewer. You know, I'm this. It's, it's different. It's, you know, more senior. It captures everything. And uh, I'm generally not a brewer. I generally build the breweries, yes, uh, yeah. so I give an ultimate flexibility to brewers uh, because that was kind of always the momentum that I have, and I build the structure around it so that we can create uh, great beers. So it was always my big focus was quality, mm. sensory program. Um, I initiated a lot of that at uh, BrewDog as well. I think, you know, it, at, at BrewDog, and even now, I, I always tend to work with uh, Bill Simpsons and uh, uh, at OXA yep. program. And uh, honestly, with Bill, I've, I've learned so much. I think he's, he's, a, he's, he's a great. I, I think he's an iconic uh, individual oh, within, he's, the, he's, he's within the UK uh, brewing scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
and and you know that that was part the, the great part of the journey that you know UK has such a fantastic heritage that you you meet people like that uh, yeah and then you are like wow you know this is like I know nothing <laughs> <laughs> and then then you become a sponge and do, you're like yeah yeah I want to get it so so I'm I'm more like a engineering yeah. quality and then I help brewers with guidelines but I always had a more um, creative and uh, people that were really keen on creating recipes yeah I was kind of helping them hone that into something that makes sense and then keeping it consistent with the team throughout the production I mean how many people generally report to you now on a day-to-day -day basis Ooh, I, I think now it's 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 more than ever well th there was yeah I think at the peak here it was 95, 95. and then uh, supply chain went to towards the other su supply chain planning sure. went to the other director wow. this year so it's a bit less but the team is That's growing still so very considerable yeah. so obviously there's very few people I suppose at least in the UK that have been in a position where they can come into a brewery and specify and commission something a project as big as Beaver Worlds mm -hmm. I mean that must have been uh, a, a exciting but also huge challenge yeah. to be part of yeah but what I think it's important this is where I see that I'm a bit lucky you know <laughs> because I I now had one I had two uh, opportunities to kind of create and build the brewing space uh, to a quite a modern level um, so twice in Scotland mm. and, and this big project here and also establishing how things are done in Lockwood to a better way but B World was great because of the investment we had the money to do it right yeah. uh, but also I knew that we had a really good position because it's a it's to become the biggest brewery in London it is probably at the time the the funkiest brand out there in many ways uh, so everybody and and also Heineken investment if you look at it that that is all attracting suppliers to really strongly want that project yeah. and I think through the process you see who actually wants to work with you the most because I think all of these big uh, manufacturers of uh, brewing equipment um, I mean, fortunately for Germans, but unfortunately for the rest of the world, usually it is from Germany. Uh, uh, and, and all of them have fantastic uh, representation in the UK. We've, we've came to uh, choose uh, Krohn's for the brewing kit. Um, and I think they have the best um, energy recovery system in a brew house. Um, they still have a patent for that. Um, yeah. uh, and, and I was happy that we could work with them. Uh, and, and they're, they're quite good and uh, have new programs in, in, in creating really modern uh, sellers. And they helped us with our designs as well. And this is what I will come, come to next. And then the packaging was always kind of battle in between Cronus and KHS we, and, we, and, and some other suppliers because we do a lot of kegs. And Cronus actually has partnering companies that do kegging with and they do big projects. But then fortunately for us, we managed to uh, agree with KHS, which are you know, world class in both kegging and canning. Yeah. And I think at that size, what we needed they, uh, at the time, and I, I probably still have the, the, the best uh, solution. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we were lucky to, to be able to negotiate well, get the price uh, to, to the level where we can afford it and enough money to buy it. So, so we started quite well off. Brew house and packaging were equipped from the pretty much they want to do a lot. Um, depends how much you push your assets. But as a company, we 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 kind of draw the line that we want to be as ethical as possible. So we don't do more than eight hour shifts for our guys, and we try to build a system where we don't go into nights and we try not to work weekends. Um, Unfortunately, it works for the majority, but not for, for all functions. Uh, but then again, we created a program so how we allow people to uh, recover after those shifts. So we created uh, a really unique, there was a lot of betting while creating Beaver World uh, in a cellar. There was some knowledge that I brought from Scotland what we were building there and then pushed that to another limit. And we have a fantastic uh, head of engineering here, Jacob Davis, who, you know, 
I'm trying to help him now rather than uh, he was he was probably <laughs> helping me out when yeah. we were building the first brewery but he owns that place and he knows every little Amazing. thing and how it works so I think the testament to that is our latest expansion was four 1200 hectoliter tanks which kind of brings the volume 30 per, 33 percent almost up at uh, Enfield and he did it all he managed the whole process wow. I helped him throughout negotiation only and some process design, but he kind of created the whole process, managed the whole project, and worked really closely with the brewing team. And there's more than one person that was involved. And, you know, I've, I've kind of let them do it no, in sure. a sense, not because I didn't want to do it, but because I had a full confidence. And they did it three weeks uh, ahead of schedule, and three tanks are full of neck oil. And the first one was filtered yesterday. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I say filtered, but it was, uh, yeah. we, we called that line filtration line, but it's just separation. So, can you give us a few ballpark figures on, on the amount of beer that the Enfield site can Yes, yeah, so it's a 150 now. hectoliter uh, five vessel brew house. Uh, it's a wet milling system, and we decided to go for wet milling because we plainly do, mainly do a um, quite pale base for our beers. We want hops to shine. Mm -hmm. And even with our lagers, um, it's still just uh, pale. We, we use the same malt for, for our lager as well. Um, uh, so that mill is more efficient, and also the system up to a mill creates less dust, for it's, <laughs> it's easier to maintain, and it's less equipment. And the cost comes to the same, I think. Uh, it, it was like that before. I don't know how it would come up now. Um, then we have uh, a, a yeast plant. And the brew house has dedicated CAP, CAP system and energy recovery system that is world class, this ecotherm system. Yeah. That's an additional water tank in a cl classical kind of uh, setup on water tanks in a brew house. And it helps uh, recover all the thermal load where you are taking or giving energy back into a process with water. Then we have one propagator and uh, four yeast storage tanks um, where two yeast storage tanks can act as propagator. Okay. So for example, when we do hazy beers, we constantly propagate. We don't crop that yeast at that site. Where here it's a bit different. So every brewery is unique. Uh, so we can kind of, you know, pitch the beer, leave a bit of uh, yeast, mm -hmm. add some wort, propagate again, get it ready for our next brew. So in a sense, when we do hazies at, um, at Anfield, it's, it's continuously brewed with the zero generation yeast, propagated yeast. Some people call it zero, some first so generation, so however you want to take it. Um, and then the cellar is set of 38 tanks from one, two, or four brews. And now with these new tanks addition, that is eight brews per tank. Okay. So that then moves through a, a, an Alpha Laval uh, 701 separator that has a 600 hectoliter hydraulic capacity. We run it in between 75 and uh, 150 hectares. And for the casual consumer of beer, how many pints can you put at maximum output? Can you put out from? Uh, well, that's a difficult question for me now. I, we, well, the brewery, when it was built, it was half of the nominal capacity, which was half a million. Yeah, yeah. So brew house and packaging can do half a million hectares. Um, it's a lot of beer, I think. It's what, a lot what of did beer. Logan said? Nine, 19 million pints? I think it's something like that. But it's improved and, and increased since uh, opening. Nine or 90, uh, yeah. I, I think it was 90. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but the thing is that we could have done with the seller only half of that. Yeah. And then we... With, with this expansion now, we pushed it to like 320,000 wow. hectares. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's what we can do at the moment. And obviously that whole expansion, you know, that whole project has come on the backdrop of, you know, the minority stake that Heineken took, then becoming a, a full stake last year, just over a year ago. But the team, you know, that you've had since day one has obviously grown hugely yeah. in that point. And what I always admire about the way that, you know, you've already touched upon it is that you, you allow people to kind of express themselves and, and do their job and, and, and learn and self-improve. I mean, is that something that's, it's clearly that's something that's been important for you since, you know, 
s since your, the start of your career? Everything is team. You can't do anything yourself. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it's, it, I always had, um, I, I think the line that I always had in my head, and it's probably drifting from even my childhood and kind of, uh, well, what is fair? Um, uh, sentence for anybody, for yourself first. When you are young, you know, you, you look the life through yourself. Am I getting the opportunity and everything? So I always had this definition that I like to create an atmosphere within the business and mm -hmm. the department that I'm, or departments that I'm running where the tal talent can thrive. So create an environment where talent can thrive. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's pretty much, we've done a lot of work around engagement and uh, a Gallup uh, survey that we've done and engagement that follows that. I mean, there's one question which is within the base is, is how do you enable, am, am, am I allowed to do my best work uh, every day? So it kind of comes in together. So if you create that for people, then you get the best out of everybody. Uh, and you know, not everybody can follow, but mm. if you have a, a, a clear uh, communication, strong managers, um, good people that care as managers, which is yeah. the most important, uh, then you create uh, that self sense of belonging and, and then people wanna push that extra mile and help you create what needs to be done. So, you know, that was always on a forefront. It wasn't just beer, it was no. like, Beer is an end product of, yeah. of a culture um, yeah. and, and a good, great team that is behind it. That's why I say, like, yeah. there was always somebody who was more creative around the beer, so they would formulate the recipe, then I would step in and kind of maybe challenge something, let yeah. them go yeah. back, and then we do it, we process it, test it together, and then push it forward. So in anything we do, we, we work like that. And, you know, I, it's super important for me, but I, I mean, in, I have a really stable direct report, like my departmental manager's um, team, and they're doing an amazing job. Yeah. You know, I feel like, I, I told him that, I feel now like I don't have to be at the brewery and things will click and they will do the right yeah. stuff. And once you get into that feeling, then I, for me, at least personally, it feels like, yeah, I've, I've done it. No, sure. Um, you know, and you know, it's hard when, you know, like at BrewDog and, and initial years here, when you're growing like 50%, 60 70 sometimes percent year to year it's hard to keep uh, keep that going right and then people decide to leave and all that has all challenges so you need to have few people that are anchors and are and are keeping that vibe and a culture at the level where it needs to be and obviously you know uh, we're acutely aware that you know there's a lot of uh, breweries and brewery owners and and people working at breweries that read our magazine come to our events, watch the videos and so on, which we're really grateful for, but not many of them would be involved in places like BrewDog, like Beavertown, with the ability to invest in these huge projects. But a lot of them will be going on their own personal journeys of, of growth, mm -hmm. of expansion. Um, I suppose you, you've learned an awful lot um, over the years. I mean, what's the sort of one takeaway that you would give to someone looking to make that next step at, at their brewery? Is there any, yeah, any th lessons? Yeah, I, th I, think, I think for me it's always uh, it's people. If you get the right people to do the right stuff and uh, you create this um, honest and, uh, and caring environment within the business, uh, it will thrive. Yeah. Obviously it needs to have substance, so <laughs> you need to have knowledgeable people as well, but you need to enable them to, uh, to yeah. develop their skill set, but there needs to be something. So, you know, it needs to be at least one person that okay. knows what they want and how they want it. Um, you know, Logan uh, was never te te technical in, in brewing, but he was amazing in understanding what the great beer is. So, for example, w two of us worked really well together. Mm -hmm. You know, his, his nose and his perception of the brewing scene in England and what the great pub culture is. Yep. You know, that I learned a lot from them, and then I know how to put it all through, uh, through the systems and, and make it work. So you need that kind of collaboration yeah. in between the people, and then the quality is number one. You know, nothing can dispute the quality. No. I mean, you know, beer, liquid bread, you go to a bakery, you buy a good bread, you know it's a good bread. You never want to go back to a white loaf from the plastic bag ever again. And it's same with the beer. So if you guys create uh, a fantastic product, 
But then again, you need to have a skill to assess if that, that beer is good. And then we come back to Bill and people like that that can help you develop skills, uh, skills like that. There are many others, but you need to find somebody who will bring you to that level. So people, quality, and then, you know, everything else kind of follows you. You can, you can make a great beer with very modest equipment. I believe so. Well, fantastic. Um, thank you, Nicola. Uh, eloquently put and um, fantastic words of wisdom. All right. Thanks thank for you, your time. Tim. Yeah, all wisdom. Thank you. Slange. <laughs> no rock. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thanks so much today to Nikola Marianovic for his time and uh, for telling us more about his journey at Brewdog and more importantly at Beaver Town. And um, I'm looking forward to now, maybe, if I'm lucky, having a little taste of some of the excellent beer that's in the barrels here. So uh, thanks for your time. I'll speak to you soon.